My goal here is to inform you about something uh, of uh, recent interest for me, and I hope to, to entertain you and maybe uh, leave you with a, f a couple of provocative uh, questions. So, <clears throat> as Kirsty said, I'm a docent here, and uh, one time on uh, one of my docent days, a little boy, maybe seven, eight years old, I don't know, asked a question. Kids ask the best questions. He said, he pointed out to that boat out there in the Kennebec, he said, is that a pirate ship? And got me thinking uh, and got me interested in maybe doing a little research on the uh, state of piracy in the, uh, in the era of uh, Elizabeth I and uh, the first few years of uh, James I, uh, Queen and King of England, respectively. Um, and uh, I uh, was uh, amazed to discover that piracy in this era was really very, very pervasive. And it wasn't just the English. It was the French, it was the Dutch, uh, the Spanish a little bit too. The, uh, the French Huguenots were um, <clears throat> very active in the English Channel along with the, uh, along with the English. But so, I, what I wanted to do is give you a, a, my sense of an overview of about 60 years of piracy activity in, uh, in and around uh, England and in the West Indies, uh, the Spanish Main, and with Sir Francis Drake uh, all around, around the globe. But I won't take you on, on all those ventures. Um, but I do, uh, what I wanted to convey, and I hope I can convey it successfully to you, is that there was in place an informal system that involved the, the crown, the queen primarily, uh, merchants uh, of the era, um, landed gentry, and then your sailors and soldiers and, uh, and other people of, of different classes all uh, worked uh, together to, uh, to produce uh, what we uh, later called the uh, English Empire. Um, so, an Elizabeth came uh, to the throne in 1558. Um, England was a backward state. Um, her position on the throne was a bit tenuous. Um, she was the daughter of, uh, we, uh, probably you all are aware, of Anne Boleyn, uh, Henry VIII's uh, second wife, and she succeeded both her um, uh, half-brother and her half-sister. Yep. So um, she had uh, uh, inherited a uh, pretty much of a bankrupt uh, uh, bankruptcy uh, in the royal coffers. Um, she was facing uh, feudal uh, and, and did end feudal campaigns on land in uh, in Ireland and in France, uh, Scotland, and Ireland continued to be uh, areas of vulnerability for her with Mary Queen of Scots in, in, in uh, Scotland and a lot of uh, local um, uh, chieftains in, in Ireland that were resisting uh, English plantations, as they called them. Uh, England was also, uh, at, at the time, um, d despite um, these uh, <clears throat> uh, problems that she faced, uh, had a very vibrant merchant community. Uh, the uh, merchant classes at the time were basically the um, uh, vital to uh, Elizabeth's success as, uh, as, uh, as queen. Um, the uh, future of England was not uh, on, the, on the European continent anymore, but on what they call the, the uh, wooden walls uh, of, the, of the ships. Their uh, <clears throat> revenues that were generated and the queen enjoyed came primarily from opportunities that lay abroad, not, uh, not within England or not on, on the continent. Now, I said uh, this is gonna be a talk about pirates and privateers. Uh, maybe I should give you a little bit of uh, definition first of the distinction between them. Uh, pretty easy distinction. Privateers were basically thieves at sea. Uh, I mean, pirates are thieves at sea, and privateers were authorized thieves, let's say. Um, I'll, I'll go into a little more detail about the, those authorizations, but uh, what I want to emphasize is that this was basically a, a, an enterprise partnership between the Crown and uh, merchant adventurers 
uh, some of which were also engaged in piratical activities. Now she called them uh, affectionately her sea dogs. Actually the term privateers didn't come about until uh, in the next century. But they were, cons they had, uh, were considered, uh, depending upon your, your, your point of view, as uh, either inherently evil, children of the wicked one. The Spanish called them Lutheranos, which means they were, they were, they were Protestants, they were followers of uh, Lutheranism. Um, now, uh, otherwise, from another perspective, they were simply merchants who were uh, will, uh, interested in opening new markets or exploiting existing markets um, around the world, especially in the, in, in the West. The uh, pirates themselves, or the privateers, consider themselves often as being heroes confronting Catholic Spain, uh, Protestant heroes. Now, uh, many of them consider that, that they were operating within the law, regardless of the fact of whether or not they actually had uh, uh, authorizations. Okay, so, uh, as I said, um, the, the real strength in England at the time was through the, the merchant classes and the merchant, mercantile economies, which uh, traded uh, basically with, uh, with uh, woolen products and uh, other cloth uh, in, uh, in Antwerp. Um, they were very powerful uh, self-funding uh, self organizations. They had their own ships, they had their own treasury, they often op operated on the basis of their own laws. They uh, armed themselves uh, without benefit of uh, a royal uh, naval support. Um, the crown simply granted them monopolies in the international trade and let them have it. But they were, became the dominating force in uh, Elizabeth's international government policy at the time. So, unlike the Spanish and the French uh, and the Portuguese, England at this time was really not interested in colonizing. They were interested in trade and commerce. And between the time of in, uh, Elizabeth's ascendance to the throne and shortly, and in, well within the, uh, um, the reign of James I, there were over 35 different private companies. Uh, and here are a few of the better known ones, including our, our company here, the, the Virginia Company. Now, they were all privately financed. Uh, as I said, uh, the Crown really gave uh, letters patent or uh, other uh, formal author, Crown authorizations for them to conduct business. My question uh, when I started looking at all of this is to follow the money. So where did all of this money come from? That these, where did the capital come from that these private uh, uh, joint stock companies were able to, uh, uh, to support their, their ventures? The shareholders were aristocrats, a few of those, mainly landed gentry from, uh, and mainly from the West Country uh, of England. Uh, merchants and some of them, and I would, I would submit many of them were uh, active or ex-pirates as well. Now Elizabeth and, and members of the court also, when they saw uh, that these were very lucrative enterprises, um, invest a little of their money or their ships as well. So, I, I, again, uh, just a little more uh, refinement of that definition. A privateer operates under a letter of mark and reprisal, which were a formal authorizations for captains of ships to go after either a, a party uh, or a country that had wronged them previously, um, or that they were just generally at war with that, uh, that country. And they, so they were all authorized then to uh, engage in um, seaborne uh, marauding to uh, seize other ships or, and or the cargoes of other ships and bring, uh, bring that loot back uh, to, uh, to England. Now, the Crown took about 20% when, they, when it was uh, honestly uh, reported to them from the, uh, from the proceeds that uh, were uh, brought into uh, uh, to, uh, to, uh, English ports. One of the vessels that, uh, uh, one of the pirates that claimed uh, uh, a, a vessel uh, renamed it, but it cost me naught because uh, it was just uh, a simple matter of taking from someone else. Okay. Um, over time, these 
letters of mark and reprisal became um, uh, granted uh, quite liberally and without prior uh, substantiation of injury or other justifications. Um, and then often pirates had just acted on their own without, without benefit of uh, paper. So, who were the people that granted these mark, uh, letters of mark and reprisal? Well, it was uh, handled uh, by the High Court of Admiralty in London, and then also by various sub-agencies uh, of the court in various ports, and part particularly the ports uh, that we're concerned with here, uh, including Plymouth, where there were vice admirals who granted these uh, letters of reprisals to uh, wrong to wrong parties. Um, the Lord Admiral, of course, was interested in granting these because he took a cut of the uh, of the proceeds. There was one Julius Caesar, not the Roman emperor, who was uh, who was uh, uh, authorized and, and uh, tasked by the crown to reform what became a very corrupt. Uh, corrupt arrangement. Um, he tried very unsuccessfully and uh, in the end uh, wound up uh, taking 20% uh, of the admiral's share for himself. So how widespread was all of this plundering going on? Well, uh, you can see here, uh, there were, uh, in just uh, four or five years after uh, Elizabeth uh, came to the throne, there were already about four, 400 pirate ships operating in the English seas, primarily in the English Channel. Why in the English Channel? Because a lot of the uh, ships that were from Spain were supporting uh, Spanish, um, uh, the Spanish Netherlands came with uh, lots of, uh, um, uh, of attractive uh, uh, cargoes. And uh, the uh, English shared the English Channel with many other um, uh, Pirates, including the the French, French uh, Huguenots, uh, Ottomans, and Barbary corsairs were active in giving uh, Philip uh, of uh, the English, the Spanish king, uh, headaches uh, in the Mediterranean. Um, so everywhere there was significant activity or, or loot to be had, there was uh, piratical activities. Uh, and as I said before, the English ambitions at this time, at least. Were, to, were in trade, not in, uh, in capturing uh, territories, but capturing um, economic benefits. So I wanted to talk uh, briefly about three of these, uh, of these many pirates, um, all from the West Country, where, as uh, many of you may know, the, the first, uh, <clears throat> the first uh, supply vessels that came to Popham Colony came from and returned to um, okay, I'm going to talk about three of these guys. Uh, John Hawkins, uh, he was responsible for uh, um, blurring the line between trade and plunder. So Francis Drake, as we know, uh, circumnavigated the, the globe, and he was engaged uh, and simply not, not, not interested at all in, in uh, expanding commercial opportunities, but simply in retribution and pure uh, plundering. And then Walter Raleigh, who was a, who was a uh, relative of, uh, of, of uh, John Hawkins and uh, our, uh, our um, Raleigh Gilbert, who was the second in command of Popham Colony, as, as many as you know. So here's where they all came from. As you can see, uh, this is called, called the uh, West Counties, or West Country of England. Uh, all of these, um, uh, ports here in, in red, including Bristol uh, and Somerset, were basically pirates' nests, and I'll go into detail of why that why that is the, had, that is the case. And here's where a lot of the activity occurred. This is where a lot of the loot was to be was to be had, and this was in the Spanish Main along the uh, south the coast of South South America and in uh, the. Uh, um, the kingdoms of Guatemala and Mexico, Yucatan at the time. Um, this is where Hawkins and uh, and um, Sir Francis Drake uh, had their uh, their uh, most uh, remunerative activities. I can put it that way. So John Hawkins, he's the one who's really started uh, very successfully in plying um, 
the um, market for slaves, he would go to the coast of Africa and would either steal slaves, sometimes and even stole slaves from a Portuguese slaver, uh, or he would bargain with uh, local tribes who had uh, uh, captured uh, war, other warring tribes and, and bring them over to, um, to Spanish uh, colonies, which were hungry for, um, for uh, cheap labor because they had pretty much at that time exhausted uh, their supply of indigenous slaves uh, through disease or maltreatment. So he would have found himself in a nice seller's market, and he would go in and first he would threaten um, the local colonial soldiers uh, with, um, with retribution if they didn't uh, allow him to trade. And often what they would do is collude with them because there was a, the Spanish crown prohibited uh, uh, any other, uh, mono uh, they retained a monopoly in sale of of products and slaves, whatever, in, into their own colonies. So he, went, he would go through some very elaborate negotiations and actually documentation to show, uh, to, to create the uh, impression that these uh, com Spanish colonials were coerced by, uh, by Hawkins to, uh, to engage in, in, uh, in trade, basically slaves. Some of them were so pleased they booked purchases on future trips. <laughs> Everybody knows a little something about, uh, so in, in any event, uh, what I want to point out here is that after he retired, he took a position as a uh, reformer of the Royal Navy and uh, basically was responsible for uh, significant uh, improvements in uh, in the Queen's and uh, James's uh, uh, naval forces. His son, also knighted like, uh, like uh, Sir John, uh, was uh, engaged in uh, piracy too, and he came from Devon, one of, those, uh, one of those West Country counties. Sir Francis Drake, well known. Uh, I just want to point out here, of course, he was a circumnavigating pirate. Uh, unlike the, uh, the others. He had no interest in establishing new trade opportunities wherever he went. He was simply, uh, he was simply interested in plunder. He was also related to John Hawkins and uh, was a captain on one of Hawkins' uh, uh, four, four voyages. Um, he was the one who uh, made England realize that peaceful trade with the Spanish colonies would, uh, would not be possible. Um, and uh, he engaged in repeated attacks on Spanish colonies in the Indies, and, uh, and it, it causes severe economic harm to uh, the uh, coffers, uh, the royal coffers of uh, uh, Prince uh, King Philip. So, uh, but he was ingenious, because what he did, he partnered first with escaped slaves uh, in some of these um, colonies, and, uh, and linked up with uh, French pirates, who were also very, uh, very much engaged. He brought back great riches to England, so many that uh, Elizabeth was able to cancel her royal debt and then uh, with, with room to spare. Um, and he uh, was also known for having uh, led this successful defense in the Armada, uh, with the help of uh, favorable weather, I guess. Sir Walter Raleigh, I just want to point out, uh, one of his, he had uh, two unsuccessful attempts to uh, uh, colonizing in greater Virginia at the time, the, the Roanoke, Roanoke colony, which I'm sure most of you are, are familiar with. But he looked at these colonies not only as places to plant um, um, settlers, but as depots for uh, future uh, piracy activities. He uh, was the queen's favorite, uh, and then uh, for a while he, uh, he went, and got, went out of favor. He was uh, um, a, uh, uh, he was tolerated by, uh, by King James up until uh, 1618 when he was, his, uh, his treasonous activities led to his execution. So that's basically the three, the three 
principal uh, pirates among the many who were engaged in piratical activities uh, in, the, in, in this area of the world uh, at the time. So they, they came from, as I, as I pointed out, most of them came from the West Country, uh, Cornwall, Devon, Bristol, and especially Plymouth. Um, these were ports of em embarkation for pirate ships and where the pirate ships returned with their plunder. There were systems in place, I'll go into a little more detail about that, for dispersal of, the, of this loot into the local markets and uh, forward. Um, and as I, as I mentioned before, uh, the Crown attempted to um, impose some, some discipline and reforms of these uh, systems without success. So what happened when all of this lucre uh, came back to the port? Well, there were commissioners there. And their job was to inventory the cargo, to verify the quote unquote legality of the seizure, um, and then to auction, the, uh, auction off the cargo very quickly. And they had, a, uh, they had a procedure where they would light a candle and then they would start the auction. And the bidder, uh, the last bidder, at the last highest bidder when the candle was extinguished would, would, uh, would take the prize. Now the local and, and crown authorities each took their cut of, uh, of this as well, and they often uh, would vie for um, their proper share. So, I said this is about pirates, privateers, and lawyers. So where do the lawyers come into play here? Well, I'm a lawyer. I'm not a pirate, but so I'm a lawyer, so I'm close, right? Um, but there was an ancient uh, medieval system in, in, in place uh, in, uh, in England at the time called free fee farms. And these were areas where there had been uh, royal grants by as early as uh, uh, Henry II um, to uh, local uh, authorities, mainly the landed gentry, um, to assert maritime jurisdiction uh, over, uh, over the ports and the revenues and to collect revenues from um, from cargoes that are that are brought in, and basically to enforce the laws of the realm, and then most uh, significantly here for adjudicating piracy claims. <clears throat> Justices of the peace were the local representatives who were involved in uh, this adjudicatory uh, process. Now, none of these uh, none of these positions were paid. They were people uh, took them because they were they were prestigious and they gave uh, local power and, uh, and profit. Um, so bribery and collusion with par uh, piratical entities was, uh, was rampant. Bribes were more remunerative than the fees they collected. Local admiralty court officials were basically aiders and abettors of, uh, of pirates. Now, most of these were amateur lawyers. Some of them had some legal training from the Inns of Court uh, in London, but most of them were basically uh, manipulators of, uh, of laws. And so uh, I'm going to go to another couple of slides here and bear with me. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about two different system, legal systems and why they conflicted and why that mattered here. Uh, civil law uh, based upon the system of codes and statutes, acts of parliament, etc. And the common law which is based upon precedent, and local, uh, local customs, and judges law. Now, under civil law, in admiralty, the admiralty courts enforced the civil law. Uh, they, uh, when they adjudicated crimes committed at sea, and that meant anything that was at sea <clears throat> and up to the high tide mark, or the first bridge over a river, that was the jurisdiction of the admiralty courts, and they uh, <coughs> would enforce crime. They would hear uh, cases uh, that would be lodged by any aggrieved party, including in, Sp in many cases uh, Spanish, uh, uh, Spanish entities. Um, and pirates could only be tried in these uh, admiralty courts. A conviction required either a confession, which usually, if, if made, was done under, under torture, or um, with substantiation by witnesses. Of course, pirates don't bring witnesses to testify against them back to port. So a lot of these people probably disappeared at sea in one, one way or another. Cases were rare, and as I said here in 
1578, of 900 uh, uh, who were actually tried, only three were hanged, and the rest were all pardoned. Very uh, beneficent uh, jury system there. Jurors' uh, bias not only uh, had a bias for uh, favoring the local boys, but they were also often uh, involved in, in, as, in business propositions with them. So the common law, which is enforced by the uh, JPs, the justices of the peace, they enforced the crimes, uh, par par piratical crimes relating to activities on land. So that they would be uh, addressing the aiders and the betters of the pirates. But they couldn't, they couldn't charge or try aiders and betters until the pirates are actually convicted by the Admiralty Court. <laughs> so, uh, and, uh, even, even the activities that the aiders and the are basically fencing a stolen cargo was not a, ca a common law crime until much later in the seven, 17th century. The justices of the peace, the ones who enforced, uh, to use the term loosely, uh, these, uh, <clears throat> these laws, uh, this, this common law, were usually the landed gentry, um, and they, uh, in many cases, uh, had uh, economic interests in uh, in the matters before them. I hope this is, these slides aren't too wordy. My wife said I mean, she's usually right about these things so that um, my slides are a little wordy. So I'm just giving you, uh, you know, a brief overview of them. So what happened uh, on, when Elizabeth died in 1603 and then James uh, ascend, ascend, ascended to the throne? Calamity. Uh, first off, he outlawed all these privateers and putting thousands of, of men uh, uh, out of work. And then to make things worse, he, he declared peace with Spain a year later. So uh, what, do these, uh, what do these pirates or former privateers do? Well, John Smith, uh, I'm, I'm not a direct descendant. If, if I were, since he didn't marry, I'd be the son of a bastard. Um, he said that English pirates when Turk, they either joined the, the, the pirate, pirate activities uh, in the Mediterranean with the Corsairs uh, or the Ottomans, or uh, more uh, likely, they uh, shifted to their pirate activities in favorable ports in, in Ireland, Kinsale one of, being one of the primary ones. The, uh, James was uh, interested in renewing focus on the fishing industry, which is probably even uh, even to our our minds today is probably not a, as as glamorous an opportunity as uh, as piracy, but piracy did continue even under James, although albeit without royal authorizations, they just carried on as uh, as usual. So, let's go back to the question that little boy asked me. Is that a pirate ship? And I have three questions for, for you all. So was the Popham colony, given, all, given this history, this uh, systemic uh, involvement of uh, locals, local gentry, everyone else, uh, was, was that booty was, uh, financed from uh, loot stolen from the, from the Spanish, who of course stole that loot all themselves from the indigenous populations? Uh, was, was the Virginia built with funds from pirate plunder? So is it little boy right? Was this indeed a, a pirate ship? Well, these are my speculations, and you know they're kind of raw speculations, but I do I have assembled a little bit of suggestive evidence. So, first of all, of the investors that we know of in the Plymouth colony. William Parker was a known and retired pirate and a slave trader, sailed with Francis Drake. Fernanda Gorgeous uh, was a, a long an investor and supporter of uh, pirate, pirate ventures and uh, colonization later on. Was, uh, he was a, a, a major official in Plymouth. And guilt by association, I'm gonna say, Sir John Gilbert, one of the investors, was the brother of a more famous but unlucky Sir Humphrey Gilbert, 
and he's half brother of Walter Raleigh and father of our, our Raleigh Gilbert here at Popham Colony. Uh, John Dotteridge, another one whose father was a privateer. I don't know about John himself. So, and there were many other uh, gentry from other West countries who were eager to invest in these uh, handsome returns. Evidence part two. So who were the beneficiaries? Well, it was all the local economy, the home port, the, the pirate's nest, the, the port of Plymouth and the other West Country ports. Um, the sailors, the soldiers, the sailmakers, the rope makers, the smiths, the victualizers, the artists and outfitters, the suppliers of gunpowder and other naval stores, and even the tavern keepers. And of course, the local gentry always uh, had a prominent role. And the lawyers. The local vice admirals um, who drafted these letters of mark and reprisal for often for a fee. Uh, the justices of the peace who either failed to prosecute or readily dismissed charges against uh, um, parties uh, accused of piracy. The customs officials who all were eager to uh, bring in the loot uh, and uh, take their cut. And the ex-pirates now mayors, members of parliament, and other local officials, just like uh, uh, Walter Raleigh uh, and, uh, um, and Drake and, uh, and, uh, and Hawkins, and the local gentry again, and crown officials, they all had their hands in it. So, my, uh, my provocative statement here is that all of these lawyers uh, participated in and benefit from a very complex, albeit informal, coordinated network of cooperating investors, adventurers, receivers, suppliers, creditors, embezzlers, etc. And it was a basically a plunder economy. So that's basically, I've talked enough, that's basically all I wanted to present. I hope it was at least entertaining, if not informative, and I'll take your questions. Okay, well, thank you for listening to me.